publicity and a good deal of controversy. Not unfortunately the music of Oliver Armstrong, Dodds and Morton, but the more commercially viable alternative as dispensed by the original Dixieland jazz band. And in that same year, Sidney Bechet bought his first straight model soprano sax in London, where he was playing virtually unnoticed at the Embassy Club. And there's a moral there somewhere. Throughout the 20s, the presence of American jazz men was to be felt on all manner of British dance floors, from Lyons Corner House in Piccadilly, where you could have heard Frank Guarante and the Georgians, right through to the Savoy Hotel, where Chelsea Queeley, Bobby Davis and Adrian Rollini were featured with Fred Elizaldi's orchestra. Paul Whiteman had visited London in 1923 and 1926, but it wasn't until 1933 that what I'd call a really top-flight American jazz orchestra made the Atlantic Crossing. Jack Hilton brought out the entire Duke Ellington Orchestra, and they opened at the Palladium on the 12th of June. <laughs> Duke Ellington's impression of Hyde Park, recorded in Decker's studios a month after his opening London concert, an event that caused a flurry of activity among Britain's dance band leaders and recording men, all anxious to get on the Ellington bandwagon. Even Billy Cotton, much better known for his variety and novelty numbers, made a welcome, and I hope you'll agree, remarkably successful essay into Ellingtonia.
Black and Tan Fantasy, Billy Cotton's band in July 1933, one of the many homegrown British recordings which helped spread the gospel of hot music during the 30s. Another great innovator of the British style, with its uh, distinctly gentlemanly approach, was the son of a London neurologist, Ray Noble, who became musical director of HMV at the surprisingly young age of 22, after studying piano at the Royal College of Music, and then winning a melody maker competition to discover a new British dance band orchestrator. In his turn, he helped discover a really good dance band singer, the young South African, Al Bowley. <laughs> For Happiness, HMV's new Mayfair Dance Orchestra, directed by Ray Noble, with Al Bowley and some inspired trumpet work by Max Goldberg. That was recorded in 1931, and I fully realise that for many tastes it's a bit far removed from New Orleans, Chicago and New York. Well, here's a Briton a bit closer perhaps to the original style and spirit, Nat Ganella. He set out quite deliberately to model himself on Louis Armstrong. Not a bad idea, really, when you consider that Louis left his mark on just about all musicians who aspire to hot improvisation.
Singing the Blues, recorded by Nat Ganilla and his Georgians in London on the 29th of January 1936 with Harold Hood piano. Jazz with a Cockney accent. There was also a French accent provided by Stéphane Grappelli, Django Reinhardt and the Quintet of the Hot Club of France. Their adaptation of Joe Venuti's chamber jazz also found expression in Britain in a short-lived group organised in September 1935 by Stan Patchett, British correspondent to the Australian music maker. It was a sextet which featured Laurie Buchan violin, Albert Harris guitar and pianist Phil Green, alias Joe Paradise and his music. Sweet Sue, Joe Paradise and his music on Parlophone in 1936, one of only 16 sides released by the group over a period of 10 months. Other small jazz groups of the time didn't even fare as well. Here's a rare recording from the Jennings and Daly collection of a band which made a single session for English Decca on the 1st of May 1939, the Rhythm Revelers. Tommy McQuaid, a trumpet, Freddie Gardner, tenor, Pat Dodd, piano, Billy Bell, bass, and Sid Heiger drums. <laughs>
could be. That's the title. The Rhythm Revellers, recording in Britain just before the war. A time when small hot bands had almost completely disappeared from the recording studios. Another exception was a small unit first organised by Lou Stone in 1940. I suppose it was his equivalent of the Bob Crosby Bobcats or the Dorsey Clambake Seven. The Stone Crackers with Dave Wilkins trumpet, George Chisholm trombone, Andy McDevitt clarinet, and Aubrey Franks tenor. <laughs> Beale Street Blues from Lou Stone and his Stone Crackers, a test pressing which was never issued on 78, kindly lent by Joyce Stone from the Lou Stone Collection. Lou was in many ways the archetypal British dance band leader, a brilliant arranger with a great love of jazz, very much influenced by the best American bands. And quite naturally, the whole British scene in the 30s was also influenced by the handful of major jazz men who came there to work, even if only briefly in the case of Armstrong, Ellington and Waller, or for longer periods like Benny Carter or Coleman Hawkins, who worked in Britain and Europe between 1934 and 1939. Shortly before returning to the States, he cut a couple of sides with Jack Hilton and his orchestra. <laughs>
The Dark Town Strutters Ball, Coleman Hawkins in London, inspiring the Jack Hilton Orchestra in May 1939. The next programme takes us back to America and some further examples of the blending of cultures which was to give jazz such a universal appeal.